I was sitting where you are right now, I'd be annoyed. I'd be thinking, who does this white woman from London in gold boots think she is telling me to protest gently in this political climate? And first of all, I'd say, leave the boots out of it. They make me feel like David Bowie, and that brings joy to my life. <laughs> secondly, secondly, we should absolutely protest. Where we see harm of people or the planet, we should stand up and say, no, it is, this is not what I stand for. This is not what I've signed up to, and this is not what I want the world to be like. Thirdly, I'm talking about gentleness, not as in passive or weak. I'm talking about what Martin Luther King taught us to be as activists, and I'm saying this in Atlanta, which brings so much joy to my heart, and which I've got tattooed on my arm. And he says we need a tough mind and a tender heart. We need a tough mind to be strategic, to know what are we trying to aim for, what's our theory of change, who are the decision makers, who are the allies, who are the blockers, who has influence on this, how do we reach our dream of a healthier and happier world for everyone. And we need a tough, we need a tender heart. We need to not focus on campaign and where we focus on people's size of their hands, about the color of their hair, about them as a human being and we're othering them. We need to protest and focus on what are the things that we want to change and how can we all be part of that solution? How can we all live in a beautiful, kind world? So when I see people fight and hate with hate, it really upsets me not only because it discredits our campaigns and stops people from listening to us, it's not good for us as activists. We burn out. If we're in chronic anger, we burn out, we're exhausted, we're not supposed to be in constant anger. And thirdly, what worries me most at the moment is that kids are looking at activism and seeing that we're bullying each other, we're screaming at each other, we're focusing on what we look like rather than what we're doing. And I do not want to live in a world where we're telling people that we want a beautiful, kind, and just place, but our activism is not beautiful, just, and kind. I'm standing here in front of you, taking up your time, because I want to talk about gentle protest, because it works. It's not fluffy. It does work, and I'm very proud to say that I have helped to change policies and laws and hearts and minds, and I want to share that with you and hope that it might help you on your journey as a gentle protester. First thing I learned as a three-year-old, see that girl with a mullet with the little arrow? My mum used to cut my hair. I'll never forgive her. I will. I grew up in a very low-income area in Everton in Liverpool in the 80s. And my dad's still the local vicar there, the minister. He hasn't moved, which is quite unusual. Lots of high unemployment, lots of hidden illiteracy issues that was talked about yesterday, lots of problems. My mum was a nurse and then a full-time mum of three kids, and now she's a politician. So I always grew up talking about different religions and politics, which is quite unusual in Britain, where we try and avoid both of them. This is a picture of our local newspaper, and it says pulpit power. And you should be able to see that we're standing outside some family homes, social housing, and we were squatting in them when I was three. Our local community, very white working class area, and it says pulpit power because we won the campaign to save those houses, and I have some friends that now live in them. But we got both bishops involved, which got us media attention. It got the issue mentioned in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. We got got people of all faiths and non involved. We got local residents to speak up and have their voice heard, but we also got lawyers to help us. We won this campaign and it was hard work and it took a long time, but we won because it was strategic and it wasn't just us moaning all the time. We did stuff. We had good intentions and we used them to do something. I was this three year old growing up watching and listening and learning as an introvert. I was often hiding in the corner, but soaking it all up. In school, I was voted head girl by my fellow peers, which was not my goal. Um, but I took on the job because I come from this very different background where 
in our kitchen table in the vicarage, people were always talking about what campaigns we were working on to get health centers in the area, to tackle lots of different issues. So I knew how to chair meetings. I knew how campaigning worked. And when I became head girl, I, the first thing I did was what everyone was moaning about for years, of saying how they wanted lockers. This is my so-called life, which is one of my favorite shows. Just thought I'd put it up there. Um, and I thought, OK, we want lockers, so what am I going to do? I'm going to ask why we don't have lockers. I'm not going to rally up everyone and do a demonstration if we don't know why we don't have lockers. So the first thing I did was to find out from my head teacher, why didn't we have lockers? She said it was a health and safety issue. So I went to the caretaker and said, is that right? Just tell me a little bit more about that. And he said, I don't know if that's right. So together, we measured all of the corridors and the rooms to see whether we could fit lockers in without being a health and safety issue. I managed to find out who was the most influential parent governor that the teachers would listen to, especially the head teacher, and get them on board, which they were, and show that it wasn't expensive. It helped with the children's heavy bags, helped with lots of different ways to benefit the pupils and the school and we got lockers. There was no protest involved. We won them because I just asked the question, and I was curious, and I was very quiet in doing it, but I did it by finding out what the students wanted and working hard at it. I ended up working in the charity sector in the UK for big international development charities like Oxfam and the Department for International Development and Government, and I burnt out as an activist. I'm an introvert, so that doesn't help when so much activism is extrovert. I was burning out because I didn't like how we were demonizing people um, by saying, you're wrong, we're right, and you need to fix this. It didn't fit my morals of treating people how I wanted to be treated. It doesn't make any sense in terms of psychology and neuroscience, because we just go into fight, flight, or freeze mode when we're attacked. And also, the other side was that we were treating people like robots. We were saying, just click this petition quickly and we'll fix it. Just go on this march. It was very transactional, and it wasn't about deep engagement, looking at the complexities of injustice, where we fit into it, where others fit into it, and how we can all be part of that solution to a problem together and not just focus on the problem. Because if we focus on the problem, our brains don't know where to go. If we focus on a vision of what we want, our brains start figuring out how to get there. So I was annoyed with the charity sector. And I wanted to work with my hands, head, and heart together and not just be online all of the time or in a downward spiral by looking at the news and not using my hands in an empowering way. So. I came up with the Craftivist Collective, which is activism through handicrafts. Not because I love craft, but I immediately noticed when I picked up a cross-stitch kit on a train to Glasgow where I was going for work, I used to love to paint, and I was feeling burnt out. I couldn't paint on a train because it would go everywhere, so I picked up a cross-stitch kit because I wanted to just use my hands, and I knew I'd be too tired, feeling burnt out to read reports, write emails. And I immediately noticed that it slowed me down. The act of crafting, you can't do it fast because you make mistakes or you break the thread. By doing a repetitive action, by doing those stitches or some paper craft, you feel naturally empowered because you've physically done something. So if you feel overwhelmed by the world and disempowered, it's a very good thing for empowerment. Prisoners have used it, needlework in prisons, and it's helped in so many ways with anger management, with empowerment, with even suicide and self-harm. It's an incredible tool. And it gave me a safe space where I was using my hands, where I was my breath was much better because it was repetitive, so I calmed down and I wasn't so angry. And I could check in with myself of, wow, I didn't realize I was so bent out. I could notice how fast I was trying to be because I'm impatient. It slowed me down and gave me a safe space to then ask myself quite uncomfortable questions I'd been avoiding. Like, am I being an effective activist or am I just doing and doing and doing lots of stuff and feeling like I'm doing so many things, it must be good and not actually engaging deeply. So it gives you this safe space to ask yourselves big questions. 
And in all of my craftivism kits, I give people craft to thought questions to go alongside. Otherwise, it's just craft. And I say, once your hands know what to do, I want you to really engage deeply on these issues of what are my values and how am I threading them through my life, through what I do, through what I say, through what I buy, what I am as a colleague, as a constituent, as a family member. Am I living what I want to be the change I want to see in the world? Massive questions, which without using your hands, you can be distracted or depressed, but using that time can really help you engage deeply and critically, which is vital for activism. Craft for me was also an incredible way, looking at the activism toolkit where I, so much, I saw so much lacking, where activism was so loud as well, which is avoiding a lot of people. A third to a half of the world are introverts. Um, so a lot of activism puts people off puts people off, even if they care deeply about an issue. So I make sure that every space I create is a safe, welcoming space. When I do workshops, you'll see, hopefully, on the slide, that I have grapes for people to share, I have juice, we have lavender smell to calm people down, to focus and not just act out of anger. We have instrumental music, it's Craft of Thought playlist on Spotify if you want it. And it's an amazing craft, it's an incredible way for people to sit alongside each other, often with people who have, have, might have different political views to you or different backgrounds. Sit alongside each other, go through those Craft of Thoughts on your own or discuss it without tension because you don't need to give people eye contact which is amazing, because if you give people eye contact when you disagree with them, again, we often freeze or we react. So to be able to listen to what people say and have that excuse of crafting while you're listening, if you disagree with people, you can say, tell me a bit more about that. I'm not sure I agree with you. But because you're not given eye contact, it creates a safe, respectful place for people to discuss issues, to challenge each other, and to feel that we can all be part of the solution and not label people as they're on that side and we're on that side. In public, we have picnics with tea and biscuits and cakes. And again, we craft, and people come up to us and ask what we're doing. We don't sit there going, do you want to ask us what we're doing? People come to us, like over here, you'll see two ladies with their sleeping babies came and talked to us. And because they'd initiated the interaction, they came with an open heart and an open mind, and we had long discussions with them about what we were protesting against and what solution we saw and how we could all be part of that solution. Again, with activism, I saw that so much of it was demonizing the power holders and the decision makers, and we know that to topple those decision makers often just, just brings up similar people. Whereas if we can get those people who are high up in the power to make those decisions and take ownership of what we want them to do, it's much more likely to be integrated into government or into businesses or into their lives. So we do intimate activis activism. We give gifts to power holders that are small and beautiful, not big and brash. They're humble. We Google everything about our board members or our politicians to find out what they're like as a human being. What colors do they love? What people do they um, inspire them? Are they a trustee of a company or of an organization that it shows us that they care about something? And we create handkerchiefs saying, don't blow it. Use your power for good. We know you've got a really difficult job, but I really want to give you this gift to encourage you to be that change that we want to see in the world and help the most vulnerable people and help our planet be a happy and healthy place. And it's gift wrapped in boxes and we write handwritten long notes about a campaign that we care about, about how many hours it took us to stitch, about how we were thinking about their role. So with this, we managed to engage board members of one of the biggest retail companies in the UK to ask them to pay the living wage, which for three years, the CEO had ignored any meetings about the living wage. So we thought, okay, I'll give, instead of going to the CEO, we'll go above him. Who's above the CEO? The board members. There's only 14 of them. I'll get 14 craftivists from across the UK that fit their target demographic of their core customers, because the board members are going to listen to their core customers more than maybe 14-year-old 14 year old boys in black anarchist hoodies. So we're going to focus on that, because it's strategic, with a tough mind. 
and say, look at your board member, board member, look about everything about them, find out what handkerchief you think that they would like, it doesn't matter what you'd like, and create something that's long-lasting, timeless, positive, and handwrite a note to them saying, for the hours it took me to make this, I was thinking about how difficult your job is as a board member, but I was also thinking about how bloody difficult it is living on a minimum wage, especially if you're providing for a family. And we love your staff, we're customers of your shop. It not only makes makes sense in terms of dignity for your staff, it makes business sense about staff retention, PR, efficiency. We had a very robust argument to say, this makes sense for you to pay the living wage and we want to encourage you to do it. We hand-delivered them in these boxes, very humbly, with a smile, very respectfully, and we got our meeting straight away after three years of nothing, and within 10 months we had lots of meetings with them to build trust and respect. And the following year, at the annual general meeting, they announced they were paying the living wage to 50,000 staff. So we said... <laughs> so, so we said, well done. We didn't say, well done us, we've won. We said, that is brilliant, thanks so much. We'd love you to be accredited living wage employers, which I know is more paperwork, but that's what we'd love you to do next, but we really want to encourage you in your job. And that intimacy of being humble, of being bespoke to them, treating them as humans, and giving them a robust argument to support them to make the right decision was much more effective. We do intrigue and activism. So where there's so much activism in capital letters with giant banners saying, do this, don't do that, which can patronize us, which stops us engaging deeply because it just tells us what to think. So we often forget it a few seconds later because we're not engaging deeply with it. We intrigue people. One of the things is we shop drop these little mini scrolls. I'm going to throw one out to someone. And it's the opposite of shoplifting. So you go to a fast fashion store that you think could be more ethical, and you drop it in a pocket. And it's handwritten, which means for the maker, you've taken ownership of that message, because you're not going to write something you disagree with. You wrap it up, it's on textured paper that's not white, not cheap. It's got a little embossed pair of scissors in it, like our logo, so that whoever finds it engages in two senses or more, because it's touch and it's sight, which means that we engage more deeply and we remember it more. And it's in luxury colors of purple, turquoise, and mauve. It's not cheap, it's not typed up. Um, it's a very beautiful thing that someone's made an effort to do, and you write really slowly, which the reader can see that you've made an effort to write it slowly. And it's one of three messages that people pick from our little kits. And you pick the message that you like the most, but it's not judging people or demonizing people, it's asking people to be curious. It's targeting people that go to these fast fashion stores and saying, we love fashion too, but let's find out who made your clothes. Or did they do it with joy or pain? Do you know who made your clothes? Let's find out. And at the bottom, it says, at FashRev, so that you can Google that, whether you're on social media or not, it goes to Fashion Revolution, which is an incredible charity where you can find out much more about how you can be part of the fashion revolution. So you're helping people on a journey to be part of being curious and care about who made their clothes, but you're not judging them and you're not force feeding them, you're leaving it in a respectful way for them to find out for themselves. It was great for us because it meant that we could get the issue into publications that don't normally cover fashion. I was very strategic of making sure we didn't mention certain brands so that it could go into magazines that rely on those brands for advertising. We took beautiful pictures. We had a video. I was in Stockholm at the time when I created it. So we, during Stockholm Fashion Week, because um, I was there for an exhibition I was running, we had a little video of people in Stockholm doing it who were very nervous, um, but it worked really well. We got on the homepage of BBC News, which is amazing. We got in The Guardian in print and online, and it was shared thousands of times. We got into fashion magazines where fashionistas um, go to. You know, we're not preaching to the converted. I actually had one journalist from Business of Fashion email me saying, thanks, I really care about this issue, and you've made it in a way that we can engage our audience without turning them off or making them feel awful, but to see that they can be part of the solution. We make sure our activism is inclusive. So I make sure that everything is very positive. It's not judging and demonizing. I target introverts. I target people who are nervous of activism that could actually make them 
even more powerful activists than people that love to scream and shout. And we get our work into places you don't see activism, whether it's books or different magazines. And even I'm number 14 on the British craft power list this year, which is quite exciting. And we get to work with people and organizations that don't normally engage in activism, who now desperately want to, but want to do it in a gentle, positive, inclusive way. Whether that's doing events for hundreds of people in galleries like the Tate, or whether it's making a craftivism badge for girl guides who now do it all over the UK. I'm working with the Scouts at the moment, which is really exciting. Or working with the Maker Fair in San Francisco a few months ago, which is a very different audience who I normally work with. Because of this gentle positivity, it means that people really want to come along to it because it's attractive. And it has ripple effects. So it's not just me that does it all. We have a methodology for people to do gentle protest using craftivism. And we had WWF use it for a campaign in Spain to protect my great and beds from a dredging a pond. And I got an email from them a few months ago saying, I don't know if you realize, but we went through your manifesto, we used every point, we created a project, um, and we won. So now there's a law in place in Spain to protect my great and beds. So thanks a lot, which was great and humbling for me that I don't have to do it all. Other people can do it. It's attractive activism. All of our kits and books fit perfectly into a Christmas stocking, just saying. They're all ethically made. I sell them in different shops. So it's getting activism out into places you don't normally see it. It's given people beautiful gifts to do on their own or with others. And it's a very different way of not seeing activism as a chore, but something attractive, positive, and empowering. Now I also do retreat spaces in conferences as well. So I'm always looking at where is there a gap and where is there a need and could I be of use to it? Sometimes I'm not and I pass on the job to someone else saying this person's much better to do it than I am. But at the moment, there's so many amazing conferences going on around the world about social change. But where is there a space for people to think deeply about all of that stuff I've learned? How do I put that into place for me, for my family, for my colleagues, for my community? So I create retreat spaces where people rest, reflect, and reconnect. They sit with an egg timer for a bit with lovely smells. They do some mindful coloring in to be aware, mindful of the baggage they're bringing to issues, whether it's physically or whether it's different stereotypes. They listen to my gentle protest playlist that's non-violent lyrics, and they can really engage with, OK, how could I put this in place? We get people to have a sweet or a grape and think about the sweetness and the joy in life and what are those wonderful things we love about life and how can we create more of that so we're not just focusing on the problems. We have a library. We have this retreat space that, again, has really helped people on their process of being the change that they want to see in the world. So it's all about a tough mind and tender heart. My to-do list is long because I do want all activism to be gentle because it's more effective. I'm going to be an activist whisperer columnist soon because I thought, we've got loads of agony ant columnists, but what about an agony ant for activists? I get asked all of the time in emails, on social media, in person, how do I be a better activist? And I whisper at people all the time what to do. And even Brandon last night was talking about how I helped him before he went to the White House which I didn't realize, but through my book and through our discussions we had. So I'm going to be a weekly activist whisperer columnist, because I feel like there's a need there. I'm going to set up a gentle protest lab, where I try out new ideas with NGOs that are funded from different funders, so the NGO doesn't come with lots of conditions, and we try out new stuff. How do we bring positive psychology more into activism? How do we use the senses more with smells, with taste, with touch, and do these projects so that if they work, we can share them with the sector, and if they don't work, we can share that. And often we learn so much more from what doesn't work. So I'm going to set up a lab, and I'm going to try and continue to be a loving disruption to people and do gentle protest. And that's what I think I'll always do. I wake up every morning thinking, how can activism be more effective? How can I be more loving to everyone, whether they're a victim, perpetrator, anyone in between? How can we make this world a more beautiful, kind, and just place where our activism is beautiful, kind, and just? So please walk humbly with me as a gentle protester if you found this useful, and thanks for your time.